Hey there, what's going on? It's Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com for Goulet Q&A episode number 62. It's January 16th of 24, I almost said 2014. I even wrote it, 2015. Still not used to that yet. I'm sure you're doing that. Um, yeah, so I'll just give you a brief update here. I got some good questions. I'm actually um, gonna be out of town next week, uh, for part of next week, taking my whole leadership team here to Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to Dave Ramsey's Performance Series Entree Leadership Conference. So that should be pretty neat. It's held on his campus and whatnot. I've talked about Dave Ramsey stuff, Entree Leadership. I got to meet Dave in New York last year. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, he's definitely, uh, you know, got an interesting style about him, but I, I like the way that he does some of his things. He's written a book called Entree Leadership that we've been able to pull a lot of really positive aspects of hiring and, you know, things like that, um, you know, performance measurements and that kind of stuff. So um, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been good. Uh, so we're actually taking our leadership team to Nashville to have kind of a very focused uh, not, I hate to say retreat because it's not that open-ended. It's, it's very much a conference. Um, but that's kind of the idea is we're going to go there, focus, do some goal setting for the year. You know, We're like kind of like a legitimate company at this point, <laughs> you know, and so we're, we're kind of starting to act like one. Um, you know, as opposed to just like me and Rachel, you know, having pillow talk about like our strategic conversations, which we still do plenty of. Uh, but, you know, still, um, we're trying to involve more of our team, really build up leaders here within our company. You know, we're pushing 30 people now, which is um, just really exciting, but also the communication gets a little tough. You know, as we grow, like kind of our number one goal is to still keep business personal. Um, and part of doing that is, you know, not ever feeling, not, not ever giving you the impression that we are as large as we are. You know, so what that means is we have to be very personal, we have to be very knowledgeable, communicate really, really well. So we have very kind of high standards there. Um, and so we're going to be working really aggressively in 2015 to kind of, as we grow, to really maintain that kind of small, like mom and pop kind of feel. Now, inevitably, there's going to be some growing pains and stuff, but uh, that's kind of what our goal is anyway. So this is one effort that we're taking to try to do that. Um, another thing, just kind of on a personal note, um, Rachel and I, you know, I'm not sure if I talked about this before, but basically we were all sick when we went. We went out of town for Christmas to go see Rachel's parents. We all got sick with the flu, whole family, kids, everything. It was just, it was really tough. Um, it took like 10 days to get over that. But on the silver lining here, um, we got to spend good quality time with our uh, daughter who was potty training at the time. So we were all sick, but she's like a potty training rock star. You know, she's been, she's basically like, as soon as like she switched over, it was like, boom, smooth transition. And now diapers are just like a thing of the past in the Goulet household. So that has been just like, we knew this day was coming. You know, our son is turning five soon, and so it's basically been five years of diapers for us um, with a good bit of overlap between our two kids, so the multiple sizes of diapers at once and all that. Um, but, uh, you know, here we are, now a diaper-free household, no baby gates in the house or anything. We're like, you know, we can walk for, you know, in our living room and just not have to use our arms at all, you know? So it's just, uh, it's really neat. So just kind of a, you know, we missed the little baby stage, but now we're, we're having really a lot of fun with our kids now at the stage they're in. Um, they're three and soon to be five, so it's just like they're just a total blast. It's utter chaos every day, but it's, it's just so much fun. <clears throat> and then um, just on a little business you note here, um, we do have one new product that we launched this week, the um, Platinum PTL 5000A. So a bit of a kind of a nondescript name there, but uh, that's what it's called. Um, it's a really neat pen. I got a video that we put out on Wednesday about it, so go check that out. It's pretty cool. Um, it's one of the most affordable gold nib pens that I've ever seen, uh, aside from like a vintage pen where somebody just, you know, was selling it underpriced or whatever, but it's a really, um, you know, as far as new pens go, as far as I'm aware, it's the cheapest gold nib pen you can get. So, you know, under $80 for a 14 karat gold nib pen, writes really well. It's even got a little softness, a little line variation to it. It's a pretty cool pen. So you might want to check that one out. So um, that said, um, because, sorry, well, I was going with the whole performance thing, um, because I'm going to be out of town for the early part of next week, um, it's going to be a lot easier just for us to do things the way we do. I know, I know we don't publish Q&A until Friday, but with me being out of town until Wednesday, and then I'm going like, to come back on Thursday, things are going to be kind of crazy. So when I would normally shoot Q&A on Thursday morning, um, it's just going to be a little chaotic. So I'm actually going to shoot Q&A at the end of, at the time that you're watching this video, 
I will probably have already recorded for the following week. So it's going to be, you know, any questions you have, any follow-up and all that that you're posting on this video is going to be, you know, not a question that I would answer next week, but it would be maybe for the following week. So um, just be aware of that. It's going to be a little bit weird with the timing and everything, and I'll address that in, in, in next week's. Um, it's, it's going to be a little weird having recorded both Q&As before this first one even publishes, but, you know, it's, a, it's just an interesting thing to kind of coordinate. But uh, it's all good stuff, good time, time. Nothing's too time sensitive here, so it's not a big deal. Um, so anyway, got a bunch of good questions lined up. Um, I got enough questions for both weeks, so that's really pretty sweet. So I kind of lined them up, and I'm just going to go through uh, as, as well as I think that I can answer them. So here we go. First question I got is uh, from Caitlin P. on Facebook. And the question is, if you had to choose between a Twisby VAC 700 or the 580, which would you choose, filling system aside? I know the VAC can take Goulet and Edison nibs, but believe the 580 can swap with the Mini. Uh, that's not necessarily true. The 580 and the Mini actually use different nib sizes, so the 580 uses a number 5 nib, the Mini actually uses a number 4. Technically, you can jam and cram them in there, but it's really not uh, the same nib itself. However, the housing and everything is the same, so you can kind of do it. The grip is different, so it's long story short, you can Franken-pen them to fit them in to each other. It's not a super clean swap, though, but, you know, it is there. <coughs> Forgive me. Got a little bit of a tickle. I've, been a, I've had a throat thing going on for a while now. Sorry about that. Like every q and I feel like for the last two months I've been coughing and whatnot, so... Um, I would say you know, it's hard to compare these pens ignoring the filling system because that's a lot of the difference between them. Uh, me personally, I like, the, I like the, the weight and the size of the VAC 700 a little better than the 580. That's just me. So if, if you got to compare those, I like the bigger nib. I like the, uh, the, filling, the, um, the size better of the VAC 700. So that would be kind of my answer to the question. Uh, however, I'm going to completely just bypass your uh, saying filling system aside because the VAC 700 to me is like the coolest part of that pen. Um, so I'm just going to throw it back in there and say, well, I still like the VAC 700 because that, that vacuum filling mechanism is just so cool. And I'm a tinkerer. I love to take my pens apart and see how they work. And it's just, it's really cool. It's a demonstrator, you know, getting to see how it all works. It's just neat. You know, I still like the 580. It's still a great pen, but, uh, you know, VAC 700 for me, it's, uh, it is cool. And it's got that larger nib, so it's a little more versatile. You get the Goulet nibs, Edison, you know, same kind of thing. Um, you can swap those out. But there's some good nib options available for the 580, so you're not really necessarily gaining much there. Um, uh, the Mini, you know, maybe. But, um, and it used to be a higher price gap between the VAC 700 and the 580. VAC 700 used to be, I think, 85, uh, and, the, and the 580 was 50, but now the VAC 700 is 65. And, you know, it's 50. So it's much closer to the 580, which is why they're compared a lot more now than they probably used to be. All right, Zeds, Z on Facebook. Um, I'm interested in buying a soft nib. My main two contenders are the Falcon and the Justice 95, okay? I'd like to know the pros and cons of buying one over the other, or should I look at another brand? Um, I would say, okay, if it's gonna be your first flex pen, then um, it's probably a big investment to go with the Justice that I'm not sure is going to be different enough for you to justify the price over what the Falcon's going to have. Um, the Justice has the adjustability of it, which is kind of neat, but um, it's kind of like a fine-tuning thing that, as a, uh, you know, if, if you're kind of just getting into flex, I would say um, it's probably not, and I'm, and I'm kind of making an assumption with that statement, it's probably not something that is going to really buy you much. Um, especially not for the price that that is, you know, um, it's almost twice, twice the price. So, um, the, the flexibility you're going to get, the line variation you get between the two pens is going to be very similar. Um, if, if you have the, the justice on its softest setting, it's going to be almost identical in writing to the Falcon. So it's not going to feel that different. The pen itself is bigger. It has a bigger filling mechanism and stuff, which is, it all factors in, but you know, how much, you know? Um, so I would say if you're, you know, if you're looking at other brands, you know, definitely Noodlers would be a contender. Um, you know, they've got the Noodlers Flex nibs and you can get it for 14 to $20, depending on the model you're getting. Um, you can, you can start messing around with some softer nibs. Um, now that said, it's going to be a completely different, you know, type of pen than would be the Falcon or the Justice 95, but it's definitely a good way to kind of get your toes wet. 
Um, your toes wet? Feet wet? Yeah, whatever. Your feet are part of your, your, your feet have toes on them, so that's, that's a legit part. You can get your toes wet or your feet wet, I guess. Um, uh, that's like a Rachelism there. I hang on with Rachel too much. She has all kinds of funny sayings and stuff. Um, but uh, I would say another one if you're shopping, especially if you like Pilot and you're kind of within that price range, sort of, you want something kind of in between the Falcon and the Justice, um, the Custom 912 is one you should look at. Um, that's got some soft nib options in there. Um, we have a um, soft fine nib option on there. We've got the Falcon nib, which is confusing because it's the 912, but it's called the Falcon, the FA nib. That is also an option as well. And then there's like a stub and a music and stuff, but um, those are the soft nib options on there. So, you know, something else to kind of throw in the mix. So hopefully that helps you out. Um, Denise R on Facebook, can you use the pilot mixable inks that are made for the calligraphy pen in any pen? You're talking about the parallel. Um, say I have two metros, can I use them in those? Yeah, so basically the, the Pilot mixable ink cartridges that are made to go with the Pilot Parallel, um, they say on the box that you should, they're only to be used for, you know, I think it might even say only used for the Parallel. I don't, I don't know exactly. I wish I'd looked that up ahead of time. But it says something in there about you should only use it in certain pens. Um, but you can use them on any Pilot Namiki pen that you want. It's just the, only, the, the mixing properties are only going to kind of make sense in the parallel. Because the way that the parallel works is you have two different pens with two different colors in them, and you can touch the tips together. And then as you're writing with it, it gradiates from one color to another. So that's really kind of cool. Uh, very cool aspect. And in fact, fun little point of trivia knowledge here, um, it's the only, I believe it's the only video the Goulet Pens has ever put out where Rachel is flying solo. So she shot that video completely by herself. And this, this was a while ago. This was back when we were still in our house. So I know that that tr little trivia question has come up before, so I just kind of gave you the answer there. But um, you can definitely use it in the Metropolitans. You can use it in whatever you want. It's just they advertise that it should only be using that pen because that's the whole mixable point of it. But you can certainly use the mixable color just as you want. Sort of like you have the platinum mix-free inks, right? They are meant to be mixed with each other. The properties are the same in the different colors, so they can be mixed, but you can absolutely use an individual color. There's nothing that I'm aware in those platinum cartridges that would be any different operating in a Metro or a Falcon or whatever that would be different from the parallel. I'm about to cough. <coughs> okay. Next question is from um, Philip Delaney on YouTube. Between the Faber-Castell Basic, Monteverde Artista Crystal, and the Conklin Duragraph, which would you recommend for someone who likes a softer nib? It's kind of an interesting spin. Those are, these are three kind of interesting pens to compare with each other. They're all kind of different materials and all kind of different sizes and stuff like that going on. But if you're talking purely about the nib, these are all stainless steel nibs, so really none of them are soft. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, they're, they're not meant to be flexible or kind of any, anything like that. Um, but out of the three that you mentioned, you know, the Artista Crystal, the nib is pretty darn stiff. Faber-Castell, the nib is pretty darn stiff as well. The Conklin Duragraph is not as stiff as the other two. So that is the one that I would say is the softest, but is by no means a soft nib. Don't even get it expecting to get any kind of line variation or anything. Um, it takes less pressure to, you know, kind of flex those tines out on that pen, but it's you're not going to be wanting to do that regularly with that. Um, but, uh, you know, it might be a noticeable enough difference to, to really kind of stand out for you with that pen over the others. Um, and, and all these pens are in a pretty good similar price range too, which is maybe why it's kind of coming up. But um, definitely the, uh, the Duragraph would be mine uh, to say. And, and we're, we're, at this point, I'm not sure exactly when they're coming in, but very, very soon we're getting a lot more Duragraphs. I know we have some kind of on the way. We had some stock issues and stuff like that for various reasons uh, right at the holidays, but uh, we're getting restocked on them now, so that is pretty exciting. And I just realized I never flipped over my little doodad there. Okay, so there you go, Philip. Um, okay, David Hunter NYC on YouTube said, oh, by the way, if you had to choose just one pen, what is your one and only Desert Island Holy Grail fountain pen and why? All ink would mysteriously wash ashore in Coke bottles. <laughs> 
That's pretty funny. Um, okay, so it's interesting. You must have been following on Facebook because I asked a couple of these questions on Facebook last week, like, you know, what's your Desert Island pen? You know, what's your Holy Grail pen? Um, and I was thinking as I was asking these questions, I was like, shoot, I, I don't know what my own answer would be to these questions. So, okay, yes, I could have censored out your question and, and fessed up and not answered it, but uh, I decided to go ahead and put it in here just to kind of make myself squirm in my seat a little bit. Um, you know, the honest truth is picking one favorite pen is like picking which is my favorite child. Like, I love all my pens. I love them all for various reasons. Some of them frustrate me more than others, but I still love them despite their flaws. So it's, it's I really can't, I, I'm not trying to cop out of this answer, but I'm trying to be completely honest. I don't have like one holy grail, like if I get this pen, my life will be complete kind of thing. I really don't have that. So for me to come up with an answer like that would be a lie. So I have to be honest and say that, you know, I the, the journey is the reward for me. Like the next pen that I get, whatever the price range, whatever features and that kind of thing, like for me it's kind of a, an endless pursuit of learning more about these various pens. So, you know, I might be getting my hands on a yard of lead pen. They're like, you know, sterling silver. You know, I've never dealt with a pen like that before. That's just really cool and interesting to me. Not looking to like do anything crazy with that, but it's just, I've never had that kind of pen before. And, you know, so it's something I might be able to learn a little bit about. I've got some other pens that are like, you know, like the Super 5 is like really affordable. And like, there's other pens out there like the, you know, just, I don't know. I just, I get really excited about learning more about every new pen that I get my hands on. So I guess the answer would, would kind of have to be like whatever the next pen is that I would have. So, I mean, that's entirely not in the spirit of the answer you're going for. Um, however, I will say that my beloved Blue Custom 74, which I have around here somewhere. Yes, here it is, my dear. Um, and uh, I recently um, was uh, enlightened by Drew from our, our customer care manager here as to how to get the ink out of the grip section on this pen, which was kind of like the one complaint I've ever had about this pen. I recently discovered how to do that. And I'm gonna totally tease you with that and not tell you what that answer is. I'm gonna make you wait until I actually put the video out on that. So total tease, but uh, that would, you know, I guess if that, would, that could be my answer, my, my beloved Blue Custom 74. I love it. Had it for a while. Not sure how well it would operate on like a desert island type scenario, whether even any fountain pen would do that great in the desert. But uh, that would be my answer. Something in there. You can pull the answer somewhere out of there. All right. <laughs> if I say enough words, I might say the right thing. All right. Jeff on the blog said, uh, you know, number one, are there any pens as minimalist as the CP1 out there, the Lamy CP1? And number two, if so, do any of them have a finer nib than the German Extra Fine? I'm going to cough again. <clears throat> um, to get, I'm going to answer your second question first, just kind of flip it around. To get finer than a German Extra Fine, you're either going to need to go with, I mean, just, this is speaking very generally here, some brands vary from others, um, but you, you essentially have German pens, Japanese pens, you've got some that are made other places, but those are like the big ones, or not German necessarily, European pens, then you got, you know, um, uh, uh, Japanese pens, and those are kind of like the big fountain pen, you know, cultures. That's where a lot of the products kind of come from, is those two areas. Um, and then um, they they grind their nibs very differently. So it's kind of universally talked about out there in the fountain pen community. Like Japanese nibs tend to be finer than the European ones, and that is true on the extra fine and fine nibs. I found basically with with, with most, if not all, of the, the Japanese companies, their mediums and broads tend to be pretty much in line with the Europeans, but the fine and extra fine tend to be finer. So the, the um, Japanese pens have, nibs tend to have a wider range along, uh, among them, but people tend to generalize because most people are buying the Japanese pens for the extra fines and fines, so they can generalize and say, oh, the extra fine nib, or the, the, the Japanese nibs are finer than the Europeans. It's not quite that cut and dry. And I have a tool called the Nib Nook on GoulayPens.com, which has writing samples of every nib that we carry. And you can compare one nib size to another and, and help to verify a lot of this kind of stuff that I'm talking about, but I'm speaking very generally. Um, so minimalist CP1. So I have a CP1, oh boy, around here somewhere. I don't even know exactly where it is. I have a bunch of Lamy pen. Oh, please tell me it's right here. Yes, got it. Okay, so 
you know, I um, the the CP1 is a very thin pen. I had a quick look, a let me quick look uh, video on the CP1. So it's a snap cap, push to post. It's just a thin black pen with a stainless steel kind of clip, and so it's very kind of minimalist, very thin. It's like the, almost the size of a number two pencil, and uh, that's really kind of it. There's not not too much else fancy stuff going on with that pen. So it is very minimalist. Um, another one that's somewhat comparable but much less talked about is the Lamy Logo. Um, Lamy Pure is another one too that's also very similar. Um, but uh, kind of, it's a, got a little more embellishments. It's got a brushed kind of look to it. Um, and the clip has a little bit different things. Not so, it's, but it's, it's kind of a similar overall shape. It's a little bit bigger. Um, if you like kind of this minimalist look to it, um, the Lamy 2000 probably would, would be one. Um, and where is my 2000? Do I even have it? Oh boy, I don't even have it right there. I think it's inked up and dirty and I need to clean it out. But um, I'm just now realizing I don't have my Lamy 2000 in my normal spot. Anyway, um, so that is definitely one that I would seriously consider. It's, def it's a gold nib, so it's gonna be much more expensive than the CP1, so it's kind of in a different league a little bit. Um, but it is certainly a minimalist kind of look. Um, another one would be the Black Matte Pilot Vanishing Point. That is also kind of very, it's almost almost more sim minimalistic than this um, in that it is all matte black. I think I've actually got one right here. I'm missing the nib unit on it, but um, the pen itself is just, you know, it's all matte black. And so it's got the clip and stuff that's there, but very little embellishments, pretty straight up, you know, it doesn't even have the shiny clip thing going on. So also kind of a similar look to it. So I don't know, maybe that, maybe that kind of fits your bill. Um, I guess you could define minimalist in a bunch of different ways, but that would be, that would be how I would define it. So um, Robert H on the blog had the next question. Hello, Brian, would you please let us know what the difference is between the materials that are used to create pens, celluloid, acrylic, ebonite, resin, and which may be a better substance than the others in your humble opinion? Yes, a lot, everything I'm talking about here is my opinion. Uh, so uh, yes, and I do have a humble opinion when it comes to materials because they really can vary a lot and a lot of them come down to preference. Um, okay, so I kind of broke them down a little bit and I, I just want to start out by saying like I've been intending to do a fountain pen 101 type video on pen materials for a long time. I just, um, the celluloid was always kind of the one that like threw me off a little bit because I didn't know that much about it. I have learned a lot about it and, um, and going through carrying the Omaso Jiva Alba, I was able to get a lot of kind of inside info about, you know, how celluloid is made. And, you know, then when we did the Delta Unica and that beautiful orange celluloid that's now discontinued, um, I was able to learn and like really get my hands on celluloid. That was the first celluloid pen I've actually owned for any extended period of time. So getting to handle that and really feel the difference between it you know, I can definitely get the appeal. So um, anyway, so I'll kind of kick it off. Basically acrylic and resin, they're, they're basically the same thing. It's essentially plastic, right? So, you know, this, this is resin, right? You know, this is, this is plastic. I don't know what's inside of here, some kind of, you know, kryptonite or something, but uh, you know, the container itself is made of plastic, just like, you know, you know, you have the Noodler's acrylic pens, those are ac acrylics, Edison pens, um, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's the, the one distinction is, and resin is a very broadly used term, so it's really hard to say, but essentially it's plastic. You have different types of plastic. There's like well, I'm, I'm no scientist, but I want to say there's thousands of different types of plastic. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but there are a lot of different types of plastic, like way more than just the couple that are used in pens. There's all different types. Um, but what ends up kind of being the two methods of plastic production in pen making that's used is you have injection molding and then you have casting. And the differences that you have there, injection molding is think of like a platinum preppy or, you know, like a Pilot G2 rollerball pen. Like, you know, it's going to be some kind of like relatively hard, brittle plastic that, you know, and you can see there's like an indentation where it's like there's a die and the plastic is, is molten and they inject it into this machine and it cools down and hardens and then it spits it out and then it just keeps on going like that. It's like all automated and it just cranks them out and cranks them out. So all of your mass produced things are going to be made of injection molded plastics for the most part because you can make them so much faster than you can make you know, the nicer kind, the cast resin. 
cast resin, think of like Edison pens, right? Like Edison uses cast resins. Those are not injection molded. They are cast into sheets, into large sheets, where there's oftentimes like swirl patterns and you can take like chunks of it and drop it in there as it's hardening. And it's basically a curing process as opposed to like a, you know, heating and an injection molding process. So they lay the stuff out into sheets. They do all kinds of, I don't know, voodoo magic or whatever to make all these swirls and these cool patterns. Patterns. The stuff hardens, they cut it into rods, and then you turn it one by one on a lathe. It's a much more time consuming process, but it really gives kind of a cool effect and it gives you, um, you know, you're able to kind of manufacture on more of a kind of a boutique level. Whereas injection molding, you're investing huge amounts of money into equipment and stuff like that. Um, and so you end up kind of with like a mass, a mass production kind of situation with the injection molding. Uh, now that said, I'm not a pen manufacturer, so this is just like stuff that I've been able to kind of piece together. I'm, I may be overgeneralizing things, so forgive me about that. I'm just telling you what I know from my experience of talking to different kind of people, and I don't think I have any proprietary information that I'm sharing here, so this is, um, this is all pretty um, shareable knowledge. Um, there are some kind of variations of resin, like Omos has their cotton resin, which is a blend of acrylic resins and um, you know some kind of like cotton, um, like cellulosic uh, material that they use that's actually extracted from like cotton uh, seeds and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so it's like a blend. So it's like a partially acrylic, partially kind of natural material. So then you get some interesting properties um, where you know the the natural kind of cell walls and stuff from the cotton will actually kind of absorb some of the moisture in your fingers, um, but you also kind of get the more durable aspect of um, kind of the acrylics and stuff and you can um, those are all cast and turned as well they're not injection molded so you know that's uh, an interesting uh, kind of uh, flair that that Omos has done on there and I know like Mont Blanc with their precious resin like is a similar kind of situation I think Pelican does the same thing with their stuff it's not just like regular injection molding it's it's cast and turned and stuff like that and so there's all kinds of different variations you can have on it um, but that's the basic idea is it's some kind of plastic um, then when you get into celluloid, celluloid is, was kind of a precursor to modern plastics. Um, celluloid is actually a derivative of the cellulosic fibers in wood. So it's the cell walls of, or it's, yeah, the cell walls of wood fibers. Um, and so it's, um, it's a natural material. It takes a long time to make. It is very flammable in the process of making it because it is coming from a natural source, um, and there's like like you know toxic. Well, I, I, I've heard there are toxic chemicals and stuff that are involved in the manufacturing process. I don't know to what degree and which ones and stuff like that, um, but uh, I've heard it's 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 a very difficult thing to prepare to actually be made, and it can take anywhere from one to two years to prepare a celluloid material before it can actually be made into a pen. Um, and I've heard this from like Delta and some other um, you know, companies that do, and Omos and some other companies that do this. Um, that's why you, you don't see a lot of celluloid pens and when you do, they're incredibly expensive because it's just, there's just, it's really hard to make. Um, the advantages of celluloid, is that you can get some really interesting patterns and stuff that are made out of it. Um, and it has um, a lot of the qualities that ebonite has, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Because it's a natural material, it kind of breathes. Um, and it has kind of a, you know, it, it can absorb moisture and repel moisture and stuff like that. It, or, or, it like swells and stuff with, kind of like you have wood. You know, you look at a desk and it's like, you can't visually tell that the desk looks any different. <clears throat> but wood, is always moving. It's always absorbing moisture, it's releasing moisture. That's why wood is kind of constructed in the various ways that it is, especially at the joints. If you join wood in the wrong way and don't account for the wood movement that you're gonna get, you're gonna get splitting and cracking and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's that same kind of thing, not nearly to that degree because you're using, you know, you're not using a full completed like wood like you would, but it's, it's made from a material of wood. So there is some of that element in these cellulose materials. Um, so you're going to get, uh, the main advantage that you're going to get with that is when you have hand oils, you know, if you have an acrylic pen or a plastic pen, um, you know, it's going to be very slick. 
but the material itself um, is brittle and it's going to um, you know build up or it's going to like very very much repel the oil in your fingers so the oil is going to stay on the surface of the pen it's going to feel kind of slick over time if you're like me if you have really oily fingers if you write with a pen for a long period of time that's why like i can't do slick metal grips on my pens because it gets slippery really quick for me um, with a, in a resin pen it's not nearly as bad i have a bunch of pens right out of frame here that's why i keep pointing there um, but you know like with a resin pen um, you know i I can hold it much longer than a metal pen, but uh, even still, it's going to feel pretty pretty slippery for me if I go for a while. Um, the things like um, uh, the celluloid and ebonite will do better in that respect because they are going to actually wick away some of the moisture out of your fingers and uh, not uh, not build it up on the surface, and and it's going to just kind of feel more comfortable to hold for a long period of time. That's the main advantage. There's some other things like it's not quite as brittle, so if you're dropping it and, and just kind of banging it around, this it's not going to get as, as as scratched up, and it's not going to be as you know it's going to be a little more bouncy, if that's the right word. Don't try bouncing it, but um, you know just that's kind of a, an aspect of it, and you know you can um, one neat thing about like the the celluloids and stuff because it is kind of a natural material, and you're handling with your hands and all that. Just your handling it will kind of naturally polish out some of the finer scratches on this thing. Now, if you get deep scratches, your fingers aren't going to wear that away necessarily, but the, some of the finer scratches are going to uh, not going to show up like they would on a plastic pen. So it's going to stay newer looking just naturally from you handling the pen as opposed to what a plastic pen. Just kind of a neat, neat little aspect that you may not know about um, some of these celluloids and like cotton resins and some of these natural materials. Um, ebonite is basically a hard rubber. So, you know, it's, um, it's going to smell like rubber. Oh yeah, celluloid has an interesting smell to it too. Um, ebonoid, ebonite is a hard rubber. It smells like rubber. Um, actually, one of the more popular uses for ebonite is in pipe stems, you know, like smoking pipe, you know, Sherlock Holmes type thing. Um, the, the part that you actually bite on is, is often ebonite. So that's a, kind of an interesting point of fact. Um, very durable material, um, very, um, you know, it's, you, you can't often get a very high polish on it. It only polishes kind of to a certain point. Um, um, yeah, well, that's not necessarily true. I shouldn't say that. A lot of times they are kind of more of a buff, or a more matte looking uh, finish to them. But now that I'm thinking about it, like we've done, you know, limited edition Edison Ebonites and stuff that are polished to a really high gloss. So that's not necessarily a fair statement to make. Um, I've seen a lot of Ebonites, especially some of the older stuff that's more of a matte finish, but I guess it can be a high polish. It's not fair statements for me to make. Um, but uh, it's going to have a lot of those similar qualities to the celluloid, where it's, it's, a, it's a natural material, and so it's going to have some of that wicking, and it's going to be comfortable to hold. Um, a lot of people like the smell. It's got a very distinctive look as opposed to um, some of the other ones. And Ebonite's one of the earlier pen materials, um, so it's, it's got very much kind of a vintage history to it. So it's very much in kind of, you know, those who like are into like vintage pen collecting and stuff often like Ebonite because it's a lot of what they are used to and they appreciate kind of that that material. So um, that's kind of a rundown of the main ones. There's definitely other ones. There's different types of metals and all kinds of other things that are used. But that's kind of the big ones as far as the, um, you know, the turned and molded uh, materials that are there. So um, that's that. Next question, Chris W. on Facebook. I'm not sure which videos in which you offer an explanation as to why such brands as Mont Blanc and Visconti are not interested in having Goulet carry their products, but it seems as though they may be less than honest with you. I've seen many online retailers who carry these pens and claim to be authorized retailers. Seems as though they aren't completely truthful in their reasoning behind not allowing Goulet to carry them. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Chris, I honestly can't really speak to any of that because, you know, I'm not plugged in to that community. Um, you know, basically I've made contact with both Mont Blanc and Visconti, Rachel and I have. Um, and, you know, the response that we got was, was very brief. You know, it wasn't this back and forth, let's get to know each other. Oh, no, you want, let's not do this right now. It's very much like a, 
you know, kind of a, yeah, we're not really looking to expand or we're not really thing. Um, so basically, though, from everything, from everything I've heard and from kind of the explanations they've given, you have to have a brick and mortar store to sell their stuff. Now, I think most of what you're seeing online, probably if, you know, a lot of it is brick and mortar stores that also have an online presence. So, you know, Montblanc Visconti, they have a certain brand appeal, brand awareness that they strive for. So they want to have a physical display in a store and they have all these kind of requirements and stuff that they want to have their things displayed because they want to have the certain kind of status associated with their stuff, which is totally their prerogative. That's their thing. Um, but we don't have a physical store here. So they are not so interested in what we have going on, which, you know, personally, I put all my stake in the online stuff. So, you know, I have a little bit different view, obviously, than they do about it. However, I'm not going to try to force the issue because if they're not ready, if they are not open and willing and wanting to kind of go the direction that we're going, there wouldn't be a good alignment of values and they wouldn't work with us well anyway. So it's not really something that I can force. Um, should they decide to change their mind in the future or, <coughs> you know, maybe they have some other reason that they don't like me. I really don't know. I don't think that that's the case. I think they don't really know who I am, which is probably much more likely the case. Um, I think that, uh, you know, they just kind of don't, they just don't want to go kind of the direction that we're going, you know, which is fine. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm not making any accusations towards anybody, and I really don't think it's some kind of big conspiracy theory. I really just think it's they have kind of a policy in place. They want to have brick and mortar stores, and if they have an online presence, they're okay with it being sold there with certain you know pr parameters around that. Um, and you know we don't have a brick and mortar store, so we don't fit into that. Uh, nor do we have any interest in setting up a brick and mortar store in order to try to get these brands. So if they ever change their minds, if anybody from Mont Blanc or Visconti happens to be watching my episode 62 Q&A, um, I would be more than happy to start talking to you. But uh, as it is right now, you know, we got kind of a good thing figured out. And uh, I like the brands that we have, so I'm just going to keep on working at that. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll keep it on the table. I'm a very open kind of businessman. So, um, that's that's kind of where where my feelings are about that. I harbor no resentment towards either of their companies. Um, Oliver F on Facebook is the deposit eventually going to be a pen offered in the normal cellulose version, as the rest of the models by Noodlers, or is it going to be a special edition ebonite acrylic versions only? On the flip side, will Nathan ever make an ebonite version of the Ahab or Nib Creeper? Very valid questions. You know, it's been interesting because Noodlers came out with a nib creeper in kind of this, you know, resin material. It's kind of like a cellulose derivative. Um, it's, a, it's not a celluloid in what I was just talking about a couple of questions ago. Um, not at all. You can tell just by the way I was describing it. There's no way you can make a $14 pen out of celluloid. Um, but it's a cellulose derivative. So that's part of why the Noodlers pens smell the way they do. It's because of the way that they're made and what they're made out of. It's kind of a natural material. I don't really know much more about that uh, than that, but <clears throat> um, they've come out with these cellulose, you know, derivative materials, and then they came out with the Nib Creeper, and then they came out with the Ahab, and then came out with the Conrad after that, and then the Conrad came out in an Ebonite, and then the Conrad came out with an acrylic. So the acrylic, now that I've explained a little bit, nicer, kind of shinier plastic with swirls and stuff like that. The Noodler's cellulose derivatives are, they're a softer material, which means they're almost never going to chip and break because they're not as brittle as the acrylics. You know, the bad thing is they smell and they um, don't have that same kind of like high polish. You can polish them up really high, but they're going to show scratches really easy because it's just a softer material. Um, so you're, you're going to be fighting that. Um, so that said, the, the, the uh, Conrad is the only pen previous to the Neponset that came out in either of these premium materials. Um, <clears throat> the Neponset, when it came out, I think because of all the development that went into it, because of the nib and all that kind of stuff, Nathan was, was only interested in kind of coming out with the, the premium materials, if you will. I haven't heard from him that he's interested in coming out with the cellulose derivative material for the Neponset. I have not heard that. I don't know if that's the case. It could just be that he can only get so many nibs, and if he can only get so many nibs, he's going to put it in that higher end pen. I don't know. Maybe he just likes those materials more. I don't know. Um, you know, 
I don't know what the availability of Neponsets will be moving forward. Whenever there's a new Noodler's Pen model, it usually takes a while for it to kind of be regu regularly available. Um, so that's kind of where I stand. I don't really know. I, it, I can't think of why it couldn't be possible. I just don't know if Nathan is going in that direction. Um, and then related to your other question, is he ever going to make an ebonite or maybe even acrylic Ahab or Nib Creeper? Um, I, don't, I don't think he's expressed that he had plans to do that. Um, I think some of the materials that he gets are hard enough to get hold of, so, you know, especially the ebonites. So he's had a hard enough time stocking ebonite Conrads, never mind spreading it out of all these different models as well. So um, I, don't, I don't know that there would be any issue with manufacturing it, an Ahab or a Nib Creeper in ebonite. Maybe there is that I'm not really privy to, but I think it's more a matter of just kind of a supply issue of he probably doesn't have enough stock and doesn't want to expand in that realm. So if I ever hear anything, you know, that said, like I just found about Noodler's Park Red like a couple days ago because I saw the video public on YouTube. Like even, even like as tight as I am with Nathan, I still like sometimes don't find out about things until it's like out there in the world and I have to kind of like figure it out real quick, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, so that said, I could have no conversations with him at all. You know, we don't talk that regularly. You know, so I, we could have no conversations at all for a while about you know Neponsets, and then all of a sudden a new one could come out. Like we could just find out about it and like oh they're available now. You know, it's just kind of how it goes. So you gotta go, gotta be gotta be ready for anything with Noodlers. You know, really. Okay, Mahesh H on Facebook. The knob at the end by Lamy 2000 that operates the piston seems to be a little loose. It does not move the piston. Oh, it, do, it does not move the piston. It just stays within the region when you first unscrew it, just before the piston actually starts to move. This bothers me because it breaks the seamless continuity of the pen. Have you seen this? Is there a fix? OK, I'm actually reading your question a little bit differently now than I originally read it. I can't tell now if you're having a problem with the pen, with the knob moving and it not moving the piston at all, that is a defect and you should return that pen. Um, if it, I think more what your issue is, is you have that filler knob on the Lamy 2000 and it's just not staying tight when it's closed on the pen. And now I'm really wishing I had my Lamy 2000 on hand because that would be super helpful in this situation. So if you can bear with me for just a moment, I'm gonna hunt around for it. This is really embarrassing because the Lamy 2000 is normally one that I have on me like at all times. And I'm just now realizing that like I don't have that pen in my rotation at this second. So dang, that is something I'm going to have to go hunting around for. I got to go talk to some, oh, here it is. Okay, I got it right here. It is kind of blended. I got like a collection of studios over here. It is blended in with my studios. Okay. Yes, that's a Lamy pen. That's a Lamy All-Star Studio. And then I got the Lamy Lady, the cow pen, and the Persona down there as well. And then I got a Safari case over here. It's really convenient that I, just, I literally just happened to have that out, and I got my, my uh, Lamy 2000 right here. So the situation that you're in is you've got this piston filler knob right here, and it's hard to even see because it's so seamless. So you unscrew this to move the piston down in the pen, and then as you screw it together, it's pulling the piston up, that's how your ink fills up into your pen. So the situation that I believe you're talking about here, um, Mahesh, is that when you are going to tighten it, it's just not staying tight and it's kind of coming loose a little bit and it's kind of giving you a break in your pen. I have seen that happen before and it is kind of a little frustrating and because you don't want to like ratchet the thing down, it ends up kind of just like flopping around and being kind of loosey-goosey. Well, the thing is, I'm going to tell you right now, just crank it down, like seriously. So it's going to feel like you're causing harm to your pen because you're going to push it past where you, it starts to give you some resistance. But do that, push it past a little bit. It's going to kind of like straighten that mechanism in there a bit. You don't want to go too far, okay? So use your own judgment. Just tighten it a little bit. 
until it's tight, and then it's good. And then when you undo it again the next time, it should be easier to kind of catch the next time after that. Sometimes it's the way these pistons are set in there. I mean, it's not often I run into that situation. And we actually check, we have kind of a checklist. You know, the Lamy 2000, we don't, we don't like go through and in, visually inspect like every single aspect of every single pen that comes through here. Like we, we know what to look out for with most pens and you know, that kind of thing. It would be insane if we like did a complete thorough check on every single pen. But um, the Lamy 2000 is one where we literally have like a whole checklist of things that we look for. Just because there's like little quirks and things and it's such a popular pen, the tines are often uh, misaligned on some of them. So you gotta kind of watch out for that. But as far as this pen goes, um, that is one thing that's on our checklist, is just make sure that knob tightens on there well. And then if we just like ratchet it an extra little bit, it's like good to go after that. So that's it. But I know like whenever you get a pen, especially a pen that's a little more expensive, your tendency is not to like, oh yeah, just do it more. Like if you're trying to remove the nib or if you're trying to do any kind of a adjustment, it's like, uh, like you get to a point and you're like, I don't want to do it any harder than that. I don't want to break it. You, this is a situation where you get into it and it's like, I know you're going to feel like I don't want to do it any harder because I don't want to break it. Well, just, you know, if you're really not comfortable with it and you got it from us, send it back. We're, we're happy to do it. But honestly, this is a situation where I've said, like, if you crank it down a little bit, it'll fix that problem uh, and pretty much never be a problem again. So um, that's kind of where I stand with that. <clears throat> and then last question I have for today uh, is Jonathan B on Facebook said, are there any future plans or possibilities for a Goulet Pens app. Um, yeah, you know, why not? That's, uh, that's certainly something that I would love. I, you know, use a phone. I have lots of apps. I could find them to be helpful. I have lots of ideas about things that would be helpful in apps. Um, as it is right now, we are still trying to like button down all of this stuff on our website first before I go building out new stuff. Um, so I've got all kinds of ideas and things, and one in particular, which I'm actually kind of excited about, but I'm gonna have to wait on it because I don't have the resources in place to be able to act on it. But I would absolutely love to do something like that. That's part of the reason that we did our website move was to have a more open structure to be able to tie in apps and things like that for the future, you know, we are going to be on this new platform for a while. We're still kind of buttoning it up, fixing some bugs and stuff, but with a long-term lens on it, there's going to be a lot of cool things in the future that we're going to be able to do that we would not have been able to do on our old site. App integration is one of those things. So sure, definitely I have big dreams, big plans for that kind of stuff, um, but I can't give anything specific right now. So this is going to tie in nicely to my question of the week for this week, which is, what features would you like to see in a fountain pen app? I'm very curious to know. I have my own ideas, but I'd love to hear what you think would be helpful, the things that you could have tied into your phone or maybe just you know other web tools or stuff like that that would be helpful for you in your fountain pen life. So go ahead and post that in the comments down there or if you have any questions, um, not for next week because I've already got those questions, but for the week after maybe. Um, you can post on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blog, lots of different ways that you can get a hold of me. So I thank you for watching this week's Q&A. Um, you know, I'm gonna let you know how it goes after I get back from Nashville. It won't happen in the next Q&A because I'll be shooting that before I go to Nashville, but the week after that, I'm sure I'll be talking about it. So that'll be kind of neat. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a great rest of your week. Thank you so much for watching and ride on. <laughs>